Hey guys, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is the daily show where we give you all the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us today is Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to the best movie news show in the entire galaxy. My name is Mark, and this is the show live from our igloo here in Burbank, California. <laughs> On today's program, Venom gets a bad guy, Jigsaw gets his own movie, and the Fantastic Four get a pregnancy test. Natasha, who's joining us today? <laughs> also joining us, Perry Nemiroff. I'm a ven vengeful bitch today. Is, is this my, yeah. my vengeful bitch face? That, that sells it, right? Well, that now I've earned this t-shirt. You no, are the nicest vengeful bitch <laughs> I've ever heard. I was trying to take mean pictures before, and I just couldn't stop laughing. My bad. Perry's mean face is like the <laughs> sweetest thing ever. <laughs> also joining us, Jeremy Johns. Well, I have no VBF, but I got to say, Natasha, with that laptop and that shirt, it looks like you're from the future. You, she looks like someone at a Blade Runner. It's like the, like the white. You look the like future. you You know, like you're on the Enterprise right there. It, I think it looks great. <laughs> also joining us, John Roca. Uh, you guys can't see this right now, but I feel like I'm behind a pillow fort of uh, technical equipment and all this. Uh, this is going to be an Technology. interesting movie talk for me, that's for sure. <laughs> These are the bolts that we have down to keep you yeah, away that's from right. Natasha. All right, we have a lot. <laughs> <laughs> to get to today, everybody. We have some breaking news stories before we get into our first Fair. official topic that you see right there on the rundown. So, Natasha, what's up? Yes, huge news. It's official. Lucasfilm announced today that a couple days after the departure of Lord and Miller from the young Han Solo movie, Ron Howard has stepped into complete production as the new director. Lucasfilm sent out a press release on the hiring of Howard saying that filming will resume July 10th. The release comes from Kathleen Kennedy, who said, at Lucasfilm, we believe the highest goal of each film is to delight carrying forward the spirit of the saga that George Lucas began 40 years ago. With that in mind, we're thrilled to announce that Ron Howard will step in to direct the untitled Han Solo film. We have a wonderful script, an incredible cast and crew, and the absolute commitment to make a great movie. Filming will resume the 10th of July. Mark, what are your thoughts on Ron Howard as director of Young Han Solo Movie? Okay. Welcome aboard, sir. Um, this is not anything that is going to be high on my radar. Like, oh, yeah, we needed Ron Howard. He's the only guy who could possibly steer this ship. But I like that they picked somebody who is a veteran of the business, who does have ties to Kathleen Kennedy and Lucasfilm, who's made some really great movies in the past. Maybe not as recently as some people out there on the Internet would have liked. But I'd much prefer somebody like Ron Howard, who, look, whether he succeeds with this last three weeks of shooting and steering the reshoots as well, or he fails miserably, this is not going to be the first line in his obituary. I mean, it, it's not going to happen like that. Whereas you could have brought in somebody young, somebody who's not tested, somebody who you can completely manipulate, but then also have that be part of their legacy going on for the rest of their career. I didn't want to see that happen. That's a really tough position to put a young person into. So I like the fact that Ron Howard, who's a veteran of the business, is now behind the camera for the rest of the Han Solo project. Perry, I know you heard the, the news yesterday and I didn't really, really get a chance to talk to you about it. Do you think Ron Howard is the right fit for the rest of this movie? I understand why Lucasfilm is going that route because clearly this is a major upheaval on that set. You need somebody who is a very seasoned director, a talented person, a calming presence on set. But I was reading that THR report and there's certain phrases that just bother me. They, they present it as Howard is considered to be a safe choice. I get it. That doesn't sound like much fun. He will be able, he will be ably he will be able to finish the movie while being a calming presence on set. That does not sound like an exciting Han Solo movie to me. However, I think they're in a position where they have no choice but to go that route. Really, one of the major things that concerns me about what's happening right now is Star Wars has been a really exciting franchise in terms of picking really talented, fresh faces, taking chances on directors with a very specific style, and I think we're getting a lot of good things for that reason. And I'm really excited for Ryan Johnson, really excited for Trevorrow. And I did like what we got from Gareth Edwards. I just hope that what's happening right now doesn't mean that in the future they're just going to go the safe route because that's not exciting or different at all. I just think that at this point it's necessary because you did take a risk with the Han Solo movie in general. And then you took another risk with having a sense of humor like Lord and Miller injected into that. And if that risk didn't pay off in the eyes of Lucasfilm, I don't think this is the the time to go back to Vegas and double down and say, no, let's just yeah. keep throwing money on the table and see if we get lucky next time. Somebody who loves Las Vegas is Jeremy Johns. What's your take on Ron Howard? Well, my take is uh, it's 
In terms of these up and coming directors out there, definitely when a uh, Han Solo movie lost its director, that was just chumming the waters for people who wanted to go there. <laughs> and I agree, it's like you should probably get someone who's a little more seasoned, who who can just the car is literally been on the road trip and in the last mile. It's like you want to drive the last mile? It's I mean it's a Han Solo movie, so I hope you stick the landing on that. I just hope that there's not a splice in the movie like Fantastic Four, where you're like, oh, that's when the new director came in, new director being Ron Howard. I want it to be like the new director. That's when that one fella from Happy Days came in. Um, I just don't want to watch the movie and have it tonally be one way, and then for the last act of it, be like, it, it definitely was completely different. So I hope it all works out. Um, like I said yesterday, Ron Howard's resume of uh, the 90s would impress me a little more than lately, but the guy does have talent. And I think calming presence, what they mean by that is like on screen, I agree, you got to have fun with a Han Solo movie, but behind the scenes, mm -hmm. I imagine there was straight up panic mm -hmm. and there would still be panic if they brought someone in that people really didn't know about. So you bring in Ron Howard, I feel like instantly everyone's panic level drops by like 75%. Like, okay, all right. Whew. Well, that's not bad, you know? So I, I feel like it was just the business choice they had to do. So I, I hope it all works out. I just don't want it to be so obvious when I'm watching the movie. Roka, your star quarterback goes down, and now who yeah. jogs into the huddle? Do you <laughs> want a young, untested rookie, or would you rather have somebody that's more of a veteran calming presence well, in there? It's a great uh, analogy you make there, because I remember a young gentleman named Frank Reich who came onto the field in the <laughs> second half of the Buffalo Bills <laughs> and led them to a playoff victory over the Houston Oilers when they were down 35-7. Yeah. to seven Frank Reich also played the first half of that game. Yeah, well, they, yeah, there, there you go, <laughs> <laughs> either way, you stepped in and took that team and brought them from behind. And that happens sometimes. I think I don't have any issue with the... I think they're saying all the right things in their press releases, calming presence. I mean, actors aren't known for being the most stable. So when you take those, you, you remove their director. And actors are very committed to directors, too, because they trust them to guide them and give them the best performances they can do on screen. So when you remove that presence and install someone like Ron Howard, Ron Howard is doing the right thing. He's meeting with the actors. He's talking with them. That's what they're saying. He's going to have time with them the rumors are three and a half weeks of shooting and five weeks of reshoot so that's a lot to commit to a film a lot of time to commit to a film so to me you want to bring someone who's going to calm it down i've changed my mind on this you know and especially when you factor in the sequences in rush the uh, if you haven't seen rush it's a fantastic ron howard film he can do action sequences so he's not just about beautiful mind not just about cinderella man the which are also fantastic films that explore emotional complex characters you also throw in the action, his ability to uh, direct action sequences when you see Rush. So he is, the, I think, a very, very good choice at this stage in the, in the process, and he will calm everyone down. And like Jeremy said, he'll drive that extra mile, bring the car in safely mm -hmm. into the port, and not have any wheels fall off or any car accidents happen on the way. And we may not get the uh, awesome, edgy Han Solo film we were hoping for, but we may still get a good one. But my thing, one real quick thing, is what Perry mentioned. It bothers me a little bit that they keep bringing in these younger film directors, and then you hear these stories about them, like kind of overlording them a little bit. It, it would make me, as a young film director, worried about walking in that situation and how much freedom I would actually have in a system like that. Yeah, and, and yesterday you brought up a great point where it, you wonder if it is an age or a generation gap yeah, that's yeah. taking place between Kathleen Kennedy, Lawrence Kasdan writing it, and the uh, Lord and Miller. Perry, is that how you're seeing this when you talk about? Ron Howard being the veteran calming presence and not necessarily rolling the dice as much as you want. Yeah, I, pretty much. And again, I just don't think they really had any other choice. Yeah. I think Ron Howard is the perfect choice at this point because they can't afford to have anything go wrong with this. But just to address what you said with it feeling like a different movie in the third act, that is probably the one good thing about Ron Howard stepping in now rather than just during res reshoots because that report also said what he's doing now is he's you know he's talking to the actors to to calm them and reassure them he's watching the footage so now that they now that they have this time they can use those last few weeks to assess what they have what they need to change it's also not just the weeks left of production he is also going to be part of post production so i do have a good feeling that in the end we're not going to see a movie where it's like oh this portion was lord and miller wow. this portion was ron howard so I think we're safe with all of that. It's just Star Wars as a franchise overall, and the fact that I happen to get excited by these directors with their own their own unique techniques to make movies. And if this was an issue, wouldn't you think they would have figured it out right from the start? It's not like yeah. Lord and Miller were brand new, like baby yeah. directors who had had one movie under their belt. What had they directed four movies four before films this? Yeah. So far, yeah. Kennedy had to have known about their process, and you would think Lawrence Kasdan would have 
understood their pitch and how they were going to go about approaching the character of Han Solo. So mm -hmm. I just don't quite understand at this point with the information I have why this issue is coming up now and not earlier. Uh, we'll have to see. But to Jeremy's point, uh, when you see an alien that looks like Ralph Malf or Potsy, you know <laughs> that was a Ron Howard directed clip. All right, Natasha, we have one more piece of breaking news to talk about. We're, we're one year away from the Jurassic World sequel, and to mark the occasion, Universal has debuted the first poster for the movie, which reveals the official title. Title. The new Jurassic World film will be titled Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. The poster also sports the tagline, Life Finds a Way, quoting Ian Malcolm's famous line from the original Jurassic Park. Jeff Goldblum will return to the franchise in this outing, joining Chris Pratt and Bryce Dallas Howard. It is directed by J.A. Bayona and will hit theaters one year from today on June 22, 2018. Perry, what do you think about the new poster and title for Jurassic World 2? It might surprise you that I'm going to say this, but whatever. What? I mean, what? That, that title, that title means so little to me. Wow. Be, and and oh, strictly because of what they did with Jurassic World. It's not like I looked at Jurassic World as presenting me with a group of dinosaurs that felt like a kingdom and now their kingdom has fallen or even even if kingdom just refers to the park overall and then the park has fallen it's just because I don't think that that movie really paved the way to that really strong title but then again we also haven't seen any footage from this movie we don't really have any plot details for all I know that plot's going to come out and it's going to suit that subtitle very very well I also just find titles to movie movies as being silly like I mean, I get, you know, Transformers, The Last Night, and all that nonsense, but, like, why can't it just be Jurassic World 2? What's the big deal? There was a mm. good day, like, in the 90s when you just had, like, a sequel come out and it was just two. And then we started doing, like, the new batch and the Secret of the U's, and then they're like, oh, we need to... Independence we, Day resurgence? We need to tell the audience that, oh, this is a new movie, and it's a totally different yeah. story, and this is a fresh original take. I like the title Fallen Kingdom. I think it makes sense for the park as a whole that this world that you had, that you built up, has now fallen. But it could also refer to a kingdom in the more militaristic sense of the word, because it seems like one of the storylines that they're going from from Jurassic World into this new movie is that some people in Jurassic World wanted to militarize the dinosaurs. They wanted to get them velociraptors onto a battlefield so they could win a war. That kingdom falling, or maybe that premise, that idea falling when the animals turn against their captors. A lot of stuff. And I like the poster. There's sparks. Roca? <laughs> <laughs> there are sparks. I, you know, as not a massive fan of the Jurassic World movie, I actually love this title. Because if you look at the taxonic, taxonomic ranking, it goes like this. Species, genus, family, order, class, phylum, kingdom, domain. So it's a reference to what the dinosaurs will be in their species and what level we're dealing with in the taxonomy of these creatures. And also, Life Finds a Way is a reference to Dr. Malcolm's line from Jurassic World. Park or Jurassic World, who says uh, a life uh, uh, finds a way. Uh, you know, so there's there's <laughs> references here that Jeff definitely is for walking back. <laughs> well, that's what uh, anyway. That's that's a perfect. Thing. By the way, have you ever seen the thing with Christopher Walken talks to Jeff Goldblum? It's a comedic piece where they don't say a word, but they do through grunts. No. And, uh, 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 yeah, uh, it's brilliant. A whole conversation for four minutes where they just do that to each other. But anyway, look, this is. I think this is an exciting thing. I love Fallen Kingdom. It gives me this idea that some some shit's about to go down, and then the sparks coming off looks like welding and stuff. So there's all of that that gets me excited. Now, for someone who didn't like the Jurassic World, I'm excited actually to see the sequel now. Uh, Jeremy, uh, Perry's a little iffy on it. Bill Nye loves it. Where do you fall? <laughs> I love the fact that you science the shit out of that. You're like, well, socially speaking, it and you broke sense. it down, dude. That was like a Crichton <laughs> novel in about one and a half minutes. Good job, bro. I love it. Uh, I actually really like the title also, Fallen Kingdom, because I don't know if they're talking about the dinosaur kingdom or the human kingdom. I don't know which one is going to fall. And so the fact that it has me talking and thinking about it. Uh, I find that interesting. Maybe they might go on the dynamic in the Lost World book. Uh, Crichton touches on how dinosaurs became extinct. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. and then he was like, it might have been like their, their social their What's the word I'm looking for? Basically, their social groupings didn't evolve, and so they just kind of died out because of the times. I thought that was really fascinating. It was never touched on in any of the movies, so they might touch on it now. Um, as it is, uh, I enjoyed Jurassic World for what it was. I gave it a good time if you're drunk. Anyone who finds my rating good time if you're drunk as A, an official rating, or B, bad, <laughs> has never seen a movie drunk. Hey. Trust me. 
It's positive. <laughs> it's very positive. So anyhow, uh, but it also is positive in that fun monster movie kind of way. That's what I saw the first movie as, or Jurassic World as. So I hope, as long as it carries on that scepter, I'll have fun with it, like the title. All right. Now we finally, Natasha, get to let the sidebar do the grunt of the work. What's our first official topic today? Sony is moving full speed ahead on their Spider-Man spin-off Venom, with Tom Hardy signing on to star and Ruben Fleischer on board to direct. While it's still unclear how Venom's story will work without connecting to Spider-Man, one thing we do know, according to an in-depth article at THR, is that Carnage will be the villain opposite Tom Hardy's Eddie Brock. Also included in the article is word that Sony is also developing films based around Mysterio, a master of illusions, and Craven the Hunter, a big game hunter who believes Spider-Man is the greatest game in the world. No details about directors or release dates at this time. Mark, what do you think about Carnage as the villain in Venom? I love this news, Natasha. Now, not all the news that you just reported I'm I'm a huge fan of, but I love Carnage versus Venom. Uh, Carnage, or as the owner of the comic book shop I used to frequent in Williamsburg, Virginia, the comic cubicle said, yes. Carnage. <laughs> called it Carnage. It was hilarious. I loved it. So Carnage <laughs> is going to be in the new movie. His name is actually Cletus, and his backstory and his relationship with Venom, I think, alone is enough to base a great film off of, which is why I'm a little nervous that now you have these two other, you got your Craven, you got Mysterio, that also might make appearances in here, and now I'm starting to get nervous. I'm starting to get some amazing Spider-Man 2 jitters again, where hmm. you just cram too many mm. baddies into one movie. So I'm going to remain optimistic. The big thing to take away from here is that we're getting Carnage in in a movie and i look on the bright side of life this starbucks cup is half full of vodka right now and i think that the carnage <laughs> movie is going to be great he's going to be an awesome villain jeremy yeah. what say you uh as a big 90s spider-man fan the story of venom and carnage or it's really spider-man venom and carnage venom is kind of, he's an anti-hero he'll kill baddies he's kind of like the punisher carnage is straight up a mass murderer and so he's like ah that's too far so he, there's mm -hmm. this big deal of responsibility on his shoulders to take this guy out. I love the fact that you knew his name was Cletus. I give you the slow <laughs> clap. Schnepp is out there right now. <laughs> <laughs> Toasting your name, my friend. Um, it, there's a part of me that feels like it's like using the Joker in your first movie, which worked for the Burton Batman, but Nolan took time to be like, okay, we'll set it up. And then the second one, we're really going to hit hard. I feel like this is coming out swinging, using the nemesis of Venom out first. However, so many times you see that movie that wants to be a franchise, it doesn't do well enough to get a second movie, and then we don't get to see where they were going. So I feel like they were like, let's just throw it all out there. Let's do, do Carnage in the Venom movie. If we get a sequel, great. We'll cross that bridge when it comes. But we're getting everything they want to do with Venom in this one. I like the fact that Carnage is in it. And it should be noted that, that as of right now, Mysterio and Craven, their appearances may be in the Carnage movie, but they're also developing films around them, so they may not necessarily be in that first movie. And if they are, it might just be they're planting seeds for future films. That's probably the better way to go. Yeah, and in that case, I'm like... Ha I feel like Spider-Man, he has a very colorful array of villains, but I feel like they're all getting their side stories without Spider-Man. So I feel like something's up. They got to cross paths somehow. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're just kind of seeing villains do stuff. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Roka, we get to see two pretty cool villains yeah. or anti-heroes at least do stuff in this new movie. You excited? Yeah. yeah, absolutely excited. I mean, I think, uh, well, I've been a fan of Venom since he first appeared in Secret Wars as a symbiote with, with uh, Spider-Man. So to me, I'm excited to see what they do with this now with the casting of Tom Hardy as well. So Carnage is an interesting decision to go with because it's, 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 it's host body is a serial killer out of prison. So mm -hmm. are they going to go that hardcore? Are they going to do throw a serial killer into a superhero movie becoming your main villain? That could be very, very dark. Um, and then I worry about the casting decision because Tom Hardy is an overpowering actor and screen presence. So if you got you got to cast somebody as Carnage who you think can be an equal to Tom Hardy. If you don't, you're going to have a Topher Grace Spider-Man 3 situation, which is hey. a limp movie where he does, you know that that guy is not going to have anything possible, uh, any kind of uh, struggle with Spider-Man at all. It's not going to be believable at all and he's going to be able to beat him so with tom hardy you really in that uh you're really in that situational casting is super important i think in this in this film craven i would love it if they went with craven i have been on the craven bandwagon since day one to make him a villain in the spider-man universe because he's an interesting cat he's russian uh he's got from the russian revolution from 1917 he destroys things with his bare hands the savage lands are in the mix mysterio is interesting too because the third iteration of mysterio was created by kevin smith 
So this brings Kevin Smith in, in the situation possibly to write that movie or be involved in that movie in somehow. So there's a lot of moving pieces here, but I agree with you. Let's just get the Venom movie mm -hmm. out and worry about 700 other characters <laughs> down the road. Let's be successful first, and then we'll worry about in installing more and more characters. But I get that they're trying to create a universe, and you're right, Jeremy, it's weird to not have Spider-Man in there. And if you watch that uh, Amy Pascal, Kevin Feige exchange, <laughs> right. you're like, is he going to be in there? I don't know. So. I think you might see Tom Holland pop up a little bit in <laughs> yeah. that Venom movie. But Carnage as the main villain here, Perry, do you like this news? And who would you cast Oh, as boy. That's a lot of pressure to put on me in like a hot That's second to come up with That's someone to go it. against Tom Hardy because I started to think about it when Roka brought it up. Uh, this isn't surprising to me at all because when we had the Amazing Spider-Man movies come out, this was kind of the plan. Wasn't the movie at that time called Venom Carnage? So right. I had kind of started to process that and... I kind of like their approach. I know we joke all the time about movie studios announcing, you know, X amount of movies when you haven't even released the first one. This isn't a headline that broke where it was like, oh my God, it is like the whole piece is about how Carnage is going to be in the Venom movie and we're going to get all these characters after. These were little teeny tiny details buried in an article that was mostly about the Sony Marvel, uh, you know, union working together on Spider-Man Homecoming. And it was just so lightly addressed. So I don't think Sony is going about it where it's like, look at all this stuff we're going to give you whether you like it or not now but i do think that this is the way to go and i think it can work because this is an r-rated movie hmm. so i think if you have a pure villain in this movie it has to be the most brutal serial killer you could possibly imagine and you guys know how i feel about brutal horror movies so this sounds to me <laughs> like the perfect union of superhero Ooh. and just pure viciousness i got an idea <gasps> charlize theron played a serial killer in monster we hear about Charlize Theron's issues with Tom Hardy on the set of Mad Max. That's your carnage. <laughs> oh, right there. Uh, I was thinking about somebody else that actually shared the screen and held their own very well with Tom Hardy, and that would be Joel Edgerton in Warrior. <laughs> oh, yeah. Or we could go really dark and get Nick Nolte to play Carnage. So <laughs> have that. And if you're in Williamsburg, Virginia, check out the comic cubicle and tell them Mark sent you. All right, Natasha, what's our next story? A new in-depth look in the form of a featurette has debuted online for Denis Villeneuve's upcoming Blade Runner 2049. This Sunday will mark the 35th anniversary of the first Blade Runner and it was Entertainment Weekly who unveiled the featurette offering a ton of never before seen footage that also includes Villeneuve, Ryan Gosling, Harrison Ford, Jared Leto and Ridley Scott discussing the impact that the original film had on science fiction and what we can look forward to with 2049. The movie opens in theaters on October 6th. Roka thoughts on the new featurette release for Blade Runner 2049. Uh, look first I'm caught up on this Nick Nolte as in and I just can't only imagine Nick Nolte in doing that part. Anyway, okay, this featurette is fantastic. It's take four minutes of your day if you haven't watched it yet and watch it. Even if you're not like necessarily the biggest Blade Runner fan, watch this featurette. The cinematography, the visuals, Roger Deakins, bring back Harrison Ford to talk about it, Ridley Scott to talk about it, all these people involved in the production. The featurette got me super excited. You ever see Serpent in the Rainbow where they shove the spike through the dude's scrotum? You're going to have to shove multiple <laughs> spikes <laughs> going through. Deak. You're going to have to shove multiple spikes through me to keep me from bouncing out of my chair during the theater because this film is going to blow the doors off my mind. I can already tell. And this featurette just gave me a small dosage of what is going to happen in the film. And it is a great exploration within of what they're trying to do with the film. And then they have the original score come in, which is one of the few soundtrack scores that I own, because I'm not a big uh, score whore. So to me, this is the only one I own, one of the few ones that I own, because it's a pulsating, awesome soundtrack. And when it kicked in in the middle of the featurette, I just lost my mind. So I, if you're a massive Blade Runner fan, this is catnip to you. And if you're, if you're just kind of a, a medium fan, you're still going to enjoy this and be excited for what's coming in 2049. I hate that we have to wait till October. That's how great this featurette was. Uh, Jeremy, on a scale of 0 to 5, how many spikes through the scrotum are going to keep you away from this movie? <laughs> oh, that, that's just another Saturday night at Casa de John's by myself, my <laughs> friend. It's <laughs> Roca. That's child's play, my man. Uh, no, I... All right, so Blade Runner is such a huge part of my childhood. The soundtrack being one of them, um, the the movie being, I mean, my my dad at, at a point he was like, oh, here's another version of it, yeah. that, you know. <laughs> and so I haven't seen that movie in decades. I remember it being great. I'm almost afraid to go back to it because I'm like, does it hold up? I want it to hold up so badly. Um, and so uh, on that, I had to get the the four disc set with every version of it on Blu-ray. So now I have it. But 
Um, I agree with you, Roka. The yeah. trailers, as I've been watching the trailers, I'm like, did this need to happen? Then you watch another trailer and you're like, did it need to happen? Then you watch the featurette and you're like, fuck yeah, it did. Mm -hmm. Because when that song kicks on, I'm like, get up. I'm watching it here because I forgot to watch it. I should watch it before I talk about it. And I have my headphones in. I start sweating. I look at Roka. I'm like, the theme just kicked on. And I was like, that was how excited I was. So I agree with you. If you're a Blade Runner fan, you have found your crack cocaine, or as we call it, a spike through the scrotum. If you're on the fence, this will really get you jacked up for it. You should watch it no matter what. Can't Buckle wait to hear what my transition belts. is, Ellis. How are you going to pitch this to me? I was going to go to me first and then let that cool off and then let Perry headline it. I was going to get out of these spiky metaphors and just tell you guys that I might be in some danger from both y'all right now because I still haven't seen the first Blade Runner. What? Sorry, haven't seen it. No, it's all good. There are movies. There are, there are movies that just, it's like, I, that slipped through the cracks. I Having said that, when I watch a featurette like this, and even the trailers before this for Blade Runner 2049, I'm so excited to see this movie. And it's, it's, it's the solemn promise I will make to everybody out there, all <laughs> dozen of my fans, is that I will watch the first Blade Runner movie before this new one comes out. And Perry, one of the reasons is this marketing material for the new one. It looks so inventive and fresh and just so dripping with sci-fi imagination that I got to check all of these out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I will probably re-watch it despite how I feel about it. And as always, I don't hate Blade Runner, but I definitely don't like it as much as its core fan base does, which is why I'm so excited about this Blade Runner, because this marketing campaign is just the perfect example of one that taps into what made that movie so special, what got it that huge fan base, but then also opens the door to anybody else who either doesn't care to watch the original and just wants to experience it, or someone who wants to appreciate it like a lot of other people do out there. And to me, the idea of seeing Roger Deakins and Denis Villeneuve sitting on this set talking about this material right there and then, that's kind of all I need to hear. So I am fully on board with this. I will watch it again. I don't know if that's going to change how I feel, but I'm excited enough about this one that... You know, I can share your excitement without saying, oh, like, I can't wait to watch the original Blade Runner 20 times before I watch this one. And the, the running time is four minutes. And just as somebody who has not, again, seen the first Blade Runner, I don't feel like this featurette gives away anything that's too, like, like story-centric that you, you feel like you're going to be spoiled on. Do you feel differently? Yeah, there's, there's, listen, for people who think that Deckard was a replicant, there are a couple of moments between him and Gosling where you think Gosling is the next iteration of him. And so when he says, you did this job before, there's a couple of moments and there's a, some quick movements by Gosling that make you think, oh crap, he is a replicant. So we are gonna get that explored even more. That's the big mystery coming out of Blade Runner was whether Deckard was a replicant or not. And I, I think they allude to it enough to make us who are fans of the film excited, but people who are like, haven't seen it, go like, oh, I don't know, I don't know what this means. So it's, it's, it's a great line that they walked in this. You and I, sir, we are in different phylums. All right, let's move <laughs> on to opening this week. We're not talking about Transformers, and Natasha, what movie are we talking about? We are talking about some vengeful bitches, and <laughs> Wendy and Perry are sporting oh, yeah. these awesome tanks so yeah. we're, um, the beguiled is coming out this week um an injured union soldier arrives at an all-female southern boarding school during the civil war soon sexual tensions lead to dangerous rivalries as the women tend to his wounds and offer him shelter and companionship so I have not seen this movie yet, though it is something I'm really looking forward to because I like the trailer, I like the time period it takes place in. Big fan of Nicole Kidman, Colin Farrell, Kirsten Dust, all these people. So, the, And Sofia Coppola is a filmmaker who I always get excited when she's making a new movie, where even a movie like Somewhere that got a kind of mixed critical reception I thought was fantastic start to finish. This is going to be a very different style movie. You've seen the film, Perry? I have seen it, and I liked it quite a bit. It's funny, I actually strongly disliked somewhere and that's probably you know the one disclaimer i would put on this and i said it to you guys earlier this it's not for everybody and i know you know the large majority of of our viewership out there and really the large majority of moviegoers period they want big blockbusters and you know high concepts with like really big plot points in them this is a lot more atmospheric and kind of just living in that house with these group of women as this situation unfolds and I thought that was more than enough for me. I mean, the characters are incredible. She obviously works really well with Kirsten Dunst, and it's the same thing here. She's fantastic. Nicole Kidman's fantastic. The young girl who was in uh, South Pond, a bunch of other things. Mm -hmm. Una Lawrence is really good. Another one to keep an eye out for. Colin Farrell is great in it, too. It is 
beautifully shot though it's freaking haunting and i feel like the trailers have been pitching it more so as you know kind of like a drama with a horror twist to it there's actually a lot of really funny beats in there too because even though Colin Farrell coming into their house sparks a whole lot of sexual tension, and that's like just really heated and dramatic and borderline scary. There's also a lot of really funny moments where everyone thinks they're acting normal, but they're kind of like, you know, doing their hair extra special and wearing really colorful dresses, and everyone's bopping around acting all, all normal. And it's, it's actual like belly laughs that you get in the middle of this mortifying scenario. So I would definitely recommend seeing it, but with, with the fair warning that. You know, if you're familiar with Sofia Coppola's work, it it's not it's not a crowd pleaser, and it can go either way because I think the Bling Ring is drastically different from Somewhere. Mm -hmm. I happen to like Bling Ring, didn't like Somewhere, love Virgin Suicides. I can go down the list, and I tend to fall either on one side or the other with almost all her movies. So keep that in mind. But I thought The Beguiled was great. All right, gents, quickly, Jeremy, you want to see this movie? Uh, I'm interested in seeing the movie. There are still movies last weekend that I didn't see because I went up <laughs> north to, to watch it. That's why when I miss movies on a weekend, I'm like, it's hard to go back. We'll see what happens. I'm either going to watch Eyes on Me or this or both. Time will tell because of time. Roka, we're Civil War buffs. You want to see this period piece? Yeah, absolutely. And this is one of the weirdest Clint Eastwood movies in his oeuvre. So this is an interesting remake of The Beguiled. And I think this is going to be a better version of that film that Eastwood did. This seems like it's it's got the right director, the right actors, and it's going to explore more of the, what do you call it, the psychological stuff going on between the men and women in this situation, both between the women and between uh, Colin Farrell and the mm -hmm. other ladies. In the, so I'm excited to see it. You, you, you cast it with some really good actors that can explore that kind of complex depth. Who <laughs> we can? You're going to go see robots fight each other again this week. <laughs> I <yeah>. mean... <laughs> Ellis, and now we move on to that part of the show called week? Buy or Sell. Hit the music, Adam. No, we still don't have any music for it. This is a part of the show where Natasha is going to give us a premise. We simply say whether we buy it or sell it. What's up first? I was like, do we have a new theme song? What's going on here? Okay, according to a new report from Bleeding Cool, reliable sources for the site claim a new Fantastic Four movie is being developed at 20th Century Fox Studios, concentrating on Franklin and Valeria, the children of Reed Richards and Susan Storm, with The Thing and the Human Torch still featuring as the other two members of the team. The current draft is being described as a more kid-friendly in tone with Bleeding Cool compared the approach to Pixar's The Incredibles. The site also states that Seth Graham Smith, the author behind Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, as well as the departed first director of the Flash movie, is penning the script. Fox hasn't confirmed the news at this point, so it should be classified as a rumor for now. Jeremy, would you buy or sell a kid-friendly Fantastic Four reboot featuring the children of Reed and Sue? I'd buy Incredibles too. <laughs> I don't know why. No, I, I would... Every time they want to make it... All right, so fans of Fantastic Four want to see a Fantastic Four movie. They've failed a couple times, so now they're like, well, I still want to see a Fantastic Four movie. They're like, we're going to do a kid-friendly one concentrating on the kids. Fan I don't think fans of Fantastic Four want that either. Uh, I'm selling it. I want to see a good Fantastic Four movie. I don't know that this is the route, uh, and bring on Incredibles 2. P. Nemi. Nope. Nope. You know, when you make three movies and none of them really strike the chord that they were meant to... Just leave it alone for a little. And you know what? There's no one stopping. There's, you're not going to be stopped years later from giving this another shot. It's just clearly not working now. There's other things that are, are better off exploring that'll feel new and fresh. Just give it a rest a little. Jay Steven Roca. Yeah, listen, I, no. Uh, of course, what Jeremy said is absolutely right. Well, the big everyone has made the comment about the Fantastic Four movies that they already did it. It was called The Incredibles. They did a good job. So by leaning into that as a major studio, to me, giving that kind of comment credibility by doing this undercuts it completely with the fan base that's gonna you would you're gonna try to appeal uh, try to appeal with this movie to so it doesn't make sense to me at all and yeah franklin and valeria are interesting characters dr doom is involved having uh, babies with sue storm in the future coming back there's a lot to play with here but to me I don't think you're ever going to get past the stigma that you're making Incredibles 2, so mm. it, it's a bad decision. I buy, I sell it. I'm just driving the car here. I'm so proud of all my kids. We're getting ice cream after the show. Uh, <laughs> you guys make great points. You don't want to be compared to the Incredibles. So that's probably not going to work in your favor. I think that from a business standpoint, from a studio exec standpoint, you don't want to touch the name Fantastic Four at all, at least for another five or ten years. I would ask the hardcore Fantastic Four fans out there, is this what you want to see? 
Honestly, would you rather see the offspring and have it be more kid friendly or would you rather just say stop tarnishing this brand that I dearly love on the comic book page and just stop messing with this thing that I care so much about? Though you did say babies, and then I started thinking about Muppet Babies, and we just went down a whole other rabbit hole because <laughs> if you could make, reboot Muppet Babies, make Incredibles too, but reboot Muppet <laughs> Babies. The best 22 minutes of any Star Wars thing ever is the Muppet Baby Star Wars episode. Okay, nanny. <laughs> <laughs> What's our next topic, Natasha? Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> you are kind of our nanny today, Natasha. So, what's our next topic? Okay, after seven years out of the horror game, the Saw franchise. <laughs> Still laughing at Jeremy. The Saw <laughs> franchise is heading back to theaters this fall with its eighth installment in the franchise. The film has been going under the working title Saw Legacy, but yesterday it was revealed that the official title will now be Jigsaw. Jigsaw, introduced in the first movie in the franchise, was the murderous mastermind behind the varied horrific traps that saw the end of countless victims throughout its seven movies. Played by Tobin Bell, there is still no word if the actor or his character will appear in Jigsaw, and not much else is known about the movie itself other than it opened this Halloween on October 27th. Perry, buy or sell the eighth Saw movie as Jigsaw. Hmm. I'm going to buy the title because I like one word titles and obviously this one has a whole lot of meaning without being Saw whatever number and I think they do need to break away from what they were left with at the end of Saw 3D where, you know, a lot of people had checked out. I most certainly had. I'm just a little nervous about it because I think one of the weakest elements of the Saw franchise is when it became about... Uh, Tobin Bell's character's legacy and how other characters factored in, and I stopped caring. I certainly didn't give a crap about those other characters who were supposed to be pivotal to that plot, so I don't really know what they're going to do with this. I think there's a synopsis floating around via Bloody Disgusting that would suggest that this movie's going to take place well after Saw 3D, and until I know who is going to be at the center of that story. Love how I'm trying not to spoil Saw movies that nobody cares about. <laughs> Until I know who's going to be the centerpiece of that movie, I kind of can't really judge how I feel about the movie overall, but cool title. Jeremy. Well, at this phase, they're just trying to get you interested, you know, and the, the title Jigsaw gets me interested. So in that, it's doing its job well. I don't care about Fantastic Four. I care about Jigsaw because I don't know if it's a prequel. I don't know if it's a sequel. I don't know if it's a remake. Well, we don't know where they're going and there are areas that they could go. I agree with you. It got a little heavy handed. It's like we know his legacy because of the other movies. So anything they tell will either contradict that in, ri in which it's Kind of a remake or uh, it'll go with it in which case we've already seen it but i am interested into where they go with jigsaw because it's not saw enter number here i buy it because i think the title enough people out there who are horror fans know jigsaw from saw so it, it, there's no sort of brand confusion there personally i get nervous uh because uh, my grandma loves puzzles and if she sees a movie called saw that comes out she's not gonna go see it she's a movie called jigsaw <laughs> it's a risk <laughs> It's a risk. So if we can have a logo that's a little more like like that just clearly states what the hell this movie is. Just have it dripping with blood or something. Grandma, don't go see Jigsaw. It's not your kind of movie. Roka? Mark, I went to see Jigsaw. So, I went. It's not so a good movie. Dead well, listen, on it. Accurate this, impression. Yeah, it's accurate. Listen, I, I'm not, uh, like Perry said, a lot of people don't care about the Saw movies. I'm one of those people that does not care about the Saw movies. But I actually buy this because if you're going to reboot it, if you're going to get people excited about it again, Jigsaw makes sense. That's that. Has, Tobin Bell has been the one consistent thing throughout all, almost all these movies. So why not use him to sell it to a new audience, new generation? I mean, these things have been around so long that a whole new generation of film make, film uh, people have come through and can rediscover this franchise all over again. Jigsaw's mm -hmm. the way you do it. It makes sense. I'm not gonna go see it, but it makes sense. Well, Saw movies ain't the only thing making announcements here today. We're very excited because we are going to save some time at the end of the show for your live Twitter questions. Hopefully we can get to one or two of them. But we have a big announcement right now because on Collider Video, the channel that you guys should be subscribed to, if you're not, click that subscribe button right now because tomorrow <laughs> night, Friday, we're going to have the premiere episode of Comic Book Shopping on this channel starring John Schnepp and special guest Evan Goldberg, everybody. Evan Goldberg, the co-producer, co-director of the show Preacher on AMC, is going to be on comic book shopping, and that's right here on Collider Video. Make sure you guys check out this Sunday and Monday evening. It's the two-night premiere of the new season of Preacher on AMC. It's just a fantastic show they do, so check out the premiere, and make sure you guys check out comic book shopping right here tomorrow on Collider Video. That's not the only cool thing going on, because we also have some transformers.
Transformers news. And for that, we go to our Transformer, John Roca. Let's take a look at this. Look at this. Are we get on the camera? Gorgeous. Collider look is giving that. away this amazing Google Play box that had that in honor of the Transformers Forged to Fight video game that's on Google Play now. The box itself, look inside, you get the Google Pixel phone, right? Yeah, look at and that. And then you get the little cover that comes with it. Now with the cover on the other side, you see, oh well, I guess we're seeing the video. Look at this. All these different all these different characters come in. You, you play as characters from the movie, also from the uh, uh, first generation characters. You see Bubblebee there. So many awesome Transformers are involved in this game. You can play it on Google Play. And like I said, you've got the phone here. You get with the game, with the, that comes with the game, and then you get the case that has the tr awesome Transformer stuff on the back. And then inside is this little button. So you can press from the back and start the game immediately on the phone. Pretty amazing. And also, within this box, you get this amazing comic book huge book transformers autocracy trilogy book that is an awesome awesome addition to your collection and inside flint dill one of the original writers co-producers of the animated series signs it for you there and also if you go a couple of pages in every single one of these has a sketch of a transformer a pencil sketch of a transformer that's different for each book so it's pretty amazing uh, giveaway for you to get here. And also, uh, in addition to the phone and everything else, you get an awesome gift card from Google Play. So there you, you go. You might expect to pay up to $99 for <laughs> something like this, John, but you can win it right now for free. How can you? Yeah, well, if you do, if you tweet at us at Collider Video and do the hashtags Transformers, hashtags for to Forge to Fight, then we will put you in the running and we will select someone who's tweeted us with all that information and we will give this away to you. This is an awesome, awesome thing to get uh, for if you're a massive Transformers fan or if you just enjoy these RPG games that you can play on your phone with Google Play. So to me, this is, I, as a Transformers fan, I couldn't ask for better uh, a better gift to get or to try to win. So there you go. And as a QVC fan, I can't imagine a better pitch man than right there, Come on. John Roca. Well Come done, on. everybody. Well Nicely done. done. I did my best. Make sure you guys check that out. Hit us up on Twitter, <laughs> at Collider Video. Later on today, we're going to have a new episode of Jedi Council is going to drop. And on Friday, the Jeremy John's hit show, Awesome Tacular is on the Go90 app right now. Download Go90, check it out. And we have a playlist of previous Awesome Tack Your episodes you can check out right now. We also have a review of Transformers. The Last Night is currently up on the channel. That's our non-spoiler review. We're also going to have a spoiler-heavy review coming out a little bit later on in the week. So keep your eye open for that. And now we move on to Mailbag. Hey, listen, you guys can write us anytime, collidervideo at gmail.com. Sometimes we'll answer your questions right here on Movie Talk, other times on our weekend show, Mailbag. And right now, Natasha, we got a pretty good one. What's up? We do. Jacob writes, hey, Collider, I read an article on how Gal Gadot only got paid like 300000 for Wonder Woman. Is that true? That doesn't seem right when you consider the box office success and also the fact that Henry Cavill made $14 million for Man of Steel. Hopefully now things will change because she's a box office star and will be paid what she's worth for Wonder Woman 2. And hopefully we get the correct mailbag on the screen up there. That was yesterday <laughs> because our mailbox has been getting hammered all morning. It's a great question that is asked, though, is that, wait a minute, so Gal Gadot only made 300000 but wait, Henry Cavill made $14 million. That's got to be some sort of gender wage gap, and it might not be as simple as that. It might not be anything at all because keep in mind, the $14 million that they computed that Henry Cavill made for Man of Steel is all after the fact, and Man of Steel crushed at the box office so i'm sure built into his contract were points on the back end and i hope the same will have been said for gal gadot as wonder woman because she is as big a part of that success as anybody else is and here's some fun stats we just found out thanks to our man mark riley is that chris evans when he was in the first captain america movie made three hundred thousand dollars then when he went on to do the avengers he made two million for that one robert downey jr when he did the first iron man movie he made five hundred thousand dollars so roca do you attribute this as being something a symptom of a greater societal problem or simply basing somebody's stats that are loaded one way versus another way well it's a good question and the thing is it absolutely is an issue of the gender pay gap 
no matter what business you're in, absolutely. is an absolute issue. There are multiple articles you can explore and investigate, written by incredibly intelligent people that explore it and look at the statistics. In this situation, though, it seems that it's being overblown because they're using this $14 million thing with Henry Cavill without giving the basis for why the $14 million is there. He was, No one's paying an unknown actor like Henry Cavill to a degree at that time $14 million to do Superman. That's ridiculous. You're seeing here Chris, Chris, Hens, Chris Evans, Chris Hemsworth, Robert Downey Jr. were all were, were paid around the $300,000 mark because you have to establish yourself. You have to sell the movie, make sure you can do the character, and then you work out deals on the back ends. Gal Gadot is going to be taken care of just fine with Wonder Woman 2, and Henry Cavill, uh, I'm sure, didn't make the made way less than the $14 million for, for Man of Steel, and then he got paid subsequently in those things. That's how this stuff works. I think this is dangerous because these kinds of stories rally or rile people up without basis in fact. And there's already enough to talk about that you can use real facts to support the gender pay gap issue, which is a legitimate issue without muddying the waters with incorrect assumptions like this and incorrect facts like this. Uh, I couldn't have said it better myself. Jeremy, you read this, and I, I, I was like, Henry Cavill made $14 million for <laughs> Man of Steel. <laughs> yeah, kidding, right. He right. didn't talk. Fresh from uh, Count of Monte Cristo yeah. to, uh, <laughs> to making $14 million. He had four bar. lives <laughs> in the movie. That kid is crushing, you know? Uh, no, uh, and that was uh, great that what you uh, said, Roke, at the very end. I got to give you all the props in the world for that as much as I bust your balls. I got to give you all the props in the world. Put because, yeah, I mean, here. when people <laughs> fudge numbers, fudge facts, it just creates more conflict for no reason, and it perpetuates a fight rather than getting good results. Uh, you know, so uh, don't do that. I, it, it's true that no one's going to pay a, a first-time person, at least for the first installment of a franchise, millions upon millions of dollars, they're going to pay them peanuts. And if, then if it crushes in the sequel, they're going to buy a few houses. It's going to be fantastic. It's how it always does. Robert Downey Jr. makes a lot for those Avengers movies. He didn't always. He, at one point, it was like, we're going to take a gamble on you, a big gamble. Because Robert Downey Jr. before Iron Man, yeah. no one was working <laughs> with the guys. No. Yeah, so, I mean, it's uh, I mean, it's funny Funny enough, I saw a whole video, like Phil DeFranco, who I'm personally, a, I'm a fan of the guy, did a great breakdown of this story yesterday also. So, I mean, all props in for that. It's, it's, it is what it is. And so don't create... Do not fudge facts and numbers just for the sake of conflict. It's not fun. That's being a troll. <laughs> Harry, what do you think of fudging numbers? Yeah, that's not cool. I mean, I don't think the numbers were fudged. I think they were just misinterpreted. And sure. then when stories spread, I mean, it's it's like the silly game telephone. All you need is one person to leave one word out, and it becomes a completely different thing. Yeah. You know, it makes me think of Rotten Tomatoes, too. It's like... A movie can have 100 on Rotten Tomatoes, but every single critic out there could have given it a 6 out of 10. This is the same thing. You're saying he made $14 million. He might have made $14 million with the amount of money he was paid as a base salary, the amount of money he got in points. Maybe one of the reports even said that that sum could have included other films, too. So right. we just need to take those numbers and actually say what they mean rather than just run headlines. Gal Gadot made 300000 while Henry Cavill made $14 million because there's no doubt that will freak people out. And I think it's safe to say that both uh, Gal and Patty Jenkins are going to be making a lot more money for Wonder <laughs> Woman 2, deservedly so. All right, I did say we're going to save some time at the end of the show for your live Twitter questions, and we're going to do one. One person won the golden ticket <laughs> to visit the world of Twitter. What do you got for us, Wendy? That lucky winner is Lohit Banerjee, who writes, with the early buzz for war for the planet of the Apes, so positive, do you think that the expectation for the Batman movie rises for Matt Reeves? Ooh, Ooh good question. Um, yeah, I, I think so. Now, we some of us got to see War for the Planet of the Apes last night, and we're still under embargo. I will tell you this, is that uh, if um, the box office is a planet, Dunstan <laughs> is about to check in to the nicest <laughs> hotel you on had that earth. Shimmy there. Um, I think that Matt Reeves has expectations already because, I mean, look, I loved, I, I've loved the first two movies in this franchise. I know he did the second one. And so now on the heels of this, my expectations are going to be sky high for Batman anyway because they always are. For Bat I went into Batman and Robin with sky high expectations, okay? Mm. I went in. I expect Batman to be great every time because Tim Burton put that on my shoulders when he knocked it out of the park in 1989. I think that this new Batman movie directed by Matt Reeves, I, Matt Reeves isn't my favorite director I've ever ran across. He may not be the perfect person for Batman, but judging 
based on what I've seen from him making these eight movies, uh, this guy's got a lot of talent. He's a really good storyteller. Perry, you and I were at that screening yeah, last night uh, when that ape checked into the hotel. Yeah, I have a, a much better, you know, non-embargo breaking reaction to that movie. <laughs> yeah, I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it definitely ups my anticipation for that movie and I think it puts more pressure on him to really knock it out of the park but at the same time it also ups my faith in him so those two things kind of go hand in hand and you know if these apes movies proved anything I think it's that Matt Reeves is a director that can make movies his own and really do what he's strong at and he has a really good sense of character, but also while respecting what a filmmaker before him started and created. And really, what what better way to walk into a Batman movie right now? Jeremy, you and I were pounding around before the screening. Did you stay for the movie? I got to say, I did stay for the movie out of sheer, uh, pure curiosity. Uh, I agree with you, though. 20 years ago, 20 years prior in the past, Jeremy Johns was there going, What? Arnold Schwarzenegger is Mr. Freeze? Perfect! George, that guy from <laughs> ER? Perfect! And I was really uh -huh. pumped about it. And uh, it's, uh, But I agree. Every Anytime there's Batman, you're going to get pumped. Um, after seeing Apes, he's not a bad choice. And as there is an embargo, I can only tell you, hmm. Somebody who is not under embargo Hi. because he has not seen the movie yet. Yo. John, Steven Roca. Oh, what's that? I was, no, I was reading a Transformers thing. Listen, listen, listen. Let me tell you something right now. Oi. Matt Reeves. <laughs> I love the movies that have done in the Apes franchise. You guys came back and said how much you loved it. So to me, I'm stupid excited for a Matt Reeves Batman. I think it's going to be great. I think he's going to be fine. And I think he'll be the reason Ben Affleck stays Batman, which I am a fan of. So uh, to me, I'm nothing but excited. Uh, for some reason, I have this stupid confidence in it. And I think he's going to be great. He knows exactly how to mirror, or, or how to mix, rather, action with these kind of darker moments, but still make it accessible to the audience. And that's a rare gift for a director to have in these kinds of movies. Looking forward to Batman whenever it comes out, and looking forward to the embargo lifting for War for the Planet of the Apes. All I can tell you in the meantime is that bananas are a great source of potassium. I want to thank everybody here <laughs> joining us today. Thank you guys for checking us out on Collider Movie Talk. Thank you to our hardworking crew behind the scenes, as well as my panel full of panelists up here. Perry, where can the kids find? You. you guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at P. Nemiroff. And you know what you can learn about on this week's Collider Behind the Scenes, Saturday, 2 p.m. PSD? You can learn about the people in the office that really keep everything afloat. You know, the, the people that motivate us and make every show so special. You know who that is? The Office Pets. Watch out for that. Oh, oh. Office pets. I'm still waiting for that call for the next beer pong round. I consider pets people, by the way, if you couldn't tell. Jeremy Johns, where can the kids find you? Glad that you consider me people. You can find me at Jeremy <laughs> Johns on YouTube, Twitter, rest of the internet, my show, Awesome Tacular on Go90. Ellis and I, we have a lot of fun. Schnepp and I, we talk some comic books. Be there or be square. John Roca. You guys can always find me at The Roca Says on Twitter and on Instagram. Uh, Outlaw Nation podcast came out this morning. New episode. Lots to talk about. Uh, please go. I got a new sponsor. Go to MeUndies.com backslash Outlaw. And then also The Cinephiles coming out tomorrow. We're going to talk about three days of the Condor. Cine-Files. And once again, go tweet at us at Collider Video. Do the hashtag Transformers. Hashtag Forge to Fight. And you might win this thing. It's awesome. You'll enjoy it. I will not check out your undies at all. And now we move <laughs> on to <laughs> Natasha Martinez. Where can everybody find you? You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at NatashaLexis underscore. And Wendy Lee Zaney. <laughs> you can find me on YouTube at the Movie Couple channel at Wendy Lee Zaney on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. I am merely Mark Ellis. Thank you guys so much for watching today. I'll be at the Comedy Store this weekend, the Houston Improv the following week. You can get tickets for upcoming tour dates at markellislive.com. See you all tomorrow. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.